how do you feel you can influence an end to settlement right. expansion and, right. and preventing Israel from bombarding Gaza yet again, which it seems to do every couple of years? Great. How can that be influenced? To well, you know, I think we need you. to stand up uh, for human rights and international law, and we need to stand up against uh, war crimes. We need to stand up against yet another invasion of uh, Palestinian territory. So it's important, I think, to <clears throat> to make this policy clear that we're just not going to support it. That that will lead to a termination uh, of our, uh, you know, of our subsidy, eight million dollars a day subsidy. I also think we need to turn to both the Palestinian and Israeli grassroots human rights groups because these are the groups that are actually building community, that are building confidence, that are building respect for human rights, that are leading the way forward for how do we solve these problems. In my view, it should not be solved by the United States dictating what they do. It shouldn't be our decision that this should be up to the people of Palestine and Israel led by the grassroots groups who are already doing that work of building confidence based on justice, human rights, and equality for all. We need to be supporting them and enabling them to lead the way forward. Thank you. Our next question is from Yu Xu Hu. I'm sorry, I'm probably butchering the name really badly. Uh, Yushu from uh, Princeton, New Jersey. He has a question about the military industrial complex. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is, the buildup of the military industrial complex since the Cold War has taken away valuable resources and you know, it's continued to build, you know, it's going, rolling forward kind of like a bulldozer, right? Uh, and lack of healthy debate has turned funding in the matters of quote unquote defense, right? Um, or war into yet another sacred cow. How can we break the logjam in order to foster actual debate? Because there's zero. Exactly. I'd say this is a reason why everybody needs to come out to Hofstra to ensure that we are included in this debate because that's exactly where that debate needs to begin, at the highest level of discussion in our presidential election because this is not a discussion that should be relegated to the sidelines. This is a really critical issue for our future and if my campaign isn't in the debate. You won't hear about the military industrial complex and the real consequences of this war and the need to have a foreign policy that actually makes us safer, not this bloated military budget. We call for cutting it in half so we can build true security by putting our dollars into what we need here at home, in jobs, in health care, and in education. Thank you. Our next question is from Andrew Dorman from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and his question is about the press and media. Yeah, that was a terrific speech, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for running for president. I appreciate it. But my question has to do with, um, I'm not sure if the public, the, you know, in, in television land, if they're really hearing your power of the people plan. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the only way to get headlines with the press is by possibly controversial, controversial messages that um, might even be wrongly interpreted. So how important for you is it to stay on message? And why do you think the press is so um, eager to uh, misalign uh, third parties? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Great, great, great question. Um, you know, one of the uh, presidents of a major media uh, conglomerate said not that long ago, um, you know, that he thought Donald Trump was certainly bad for the country, but he sure was good for his media organization. And, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> media has been consolidated into the hands of just a few major big corporate organizations. This is why we need to use antitrust laws and begin to break up the media conglomerates if we're gonna truly fix it. And the disaster that this election is, 
I think, is really driving home to a lot of people about why we need to democratize the media to break it down to support local and small and community-based media that's really out there to do its job and to actually inform and empower the American public. That's why we have a First Amendment. That's why we have freedom of the press because we need a free press if we are to function as a democracy. So this is a really critical issue, and I think it's something that we just have to stand up and fight for. Uh, and we have to fight for it uh, as part of a broader coalition of issues. If you're only fighting on democracy issues, people are so busy just trying to pay their rent and keep a roof over their head and put food on the table and get through college, you know, we have to really speak to a broad agenda that addresses our democracy reforms, liberating our media, as well as uh, meeting our human needs and our economic human rights. They need to come together, but we can't leave the media out of it. And that includes not only breaking up the big media, it means also taking back the public airwaves which belong to us. We should not have to, you know, fork over billions of dollars in political campaigns in order to be able to hear the candidates. Uh, airtime should be available for free to qualified candidates who are actually on the ballot. So we need public financing of our campaigns, we need free airtime, and uh, we need to break up the big media so it's actually serving us. It's not rocket science, it's about standing up and doing the obvious common sense things. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ruhin Nair from Monmouth Junction, New Jersey, and they have a question about student debt. All right. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Stein. It's Hi. Oh, okay, sure. Oh. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, hi. So uh, I have to, have to confess, uh, I used to be a Bernie supporter, and now I'm actually a Hillary Clinton supporter. <laughs> and, oh. oh. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, no, but, um, but, I'm an um, unbeliever. <laughs> okay, no, but, um, I'm here because I think your voice is important, and I think that what you have to say is very important, and it's part of democracy. So, um, my question, Dr. Stein, to you is, um, Secretary Clinton has a plan to make college debt-free, and reduce student debt, whereas your plan is to just um, cancel it altogether. And you've often said that you're going to, um, it's, I've, I've been a little confused while listening to it. You said you're gonna take the money that they used for Wall Street and you're gonna use it to, okay, I was wondering if you could expand on that. That was my question. Okay, great. So my point is that we came up with $16 trillion to bail out Wall Street. If we could come up with $16 trillion to bail out the crooks who crashed the economy through their waste, fraud, and abuse, which is undisputed, they didn't go to jail because they were too big to jail, but there's no doubt that this was waste, fraud, and abuse on Wall Street. It was the mortgage, it was the subprime mortgage fraud, and then it was massive accounting uh, fraud as well. So their waste, fraud, and abuse uh, crashed the economy, yet we, Democrats and Republicans came up with $16 trillion in order to bail them out. My point is that if we could come up with $16 trillion to bail out the crooks, we can come up with $1.3 trillion to bail out young people locked into debt. And how can we do that? There are so many ways we can do that. So for one thing, cutting the military provides us with about $500 billion a year that we can put into things that we need, like ending student debt. Um, another way we can do it, you know, there's one sector of the economy right now that does not pay a sales tax. Uh, that is Wall Street, the most profitable sector of the economy. So by asking Wall Street, by instructing Wall Street, that they have to fork something over too. If they paid a very small so-called transaction tax or a Wall Street sales tax, we would have hundreds of billions of dollars as well with which to pay down that debt. There is, there is no lack of resources here and there is no lack of ways to come up with them. What we lack 
are politicians who are actually accountable to us rather than to the big banks. And I have to say that while Hillary changes her tune, she has had a very consistent walk for decades, actually. Hillary has done the favors for Wall Street. And the crisis that we are in right now with our economy, and in fact with this right-wing extremism and Donald Trump, where does that come from? That grows out of the economic misery that working people and, and middle class people are feeling as they uh, kind of fall further down the economic scale. So it's this insecurity which has always um, kind of created right-wing extremism. That's when you see people become very vulnerable uh, to demagogues. But how did we get to this economic misery? You know, we got here uh, because of NAFTA, which sent millions of jobs overseas and pushed down wages here. And who passed NAFTA? Remember, it was Bill Clinton who signed it. It was a bipartisan uh, assault on our economy. And Hillary and Bill were both there leading the charge. Likewise, uh, Wall Street deregulation laid the groundwork for the Wall Street meltdown, which disappeared nine million jobs, led to the theft of five million homes. So my point is that the Clintons, and Hillary in particular, are not the solution to the Donald Trumps. That if we have more of these neoliberal policies of the centrist Democrats, we will have more of the economic misery that continues to produce right-wing uh, extremism. As Bernie Sanders himself said, the only solution to the economic crisis we face are truly radical, progressive policies that will not come from the Democratic or Republican parties. So our campaign, in many ways, is Bernie Sanders on steroids. So I urge everyone who saw reason to support Bernie, you have twice as much reason to support our campaign. So give it some thought. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is from Michael Schur from New Brunswick, New Jersey. And he has a question about gun control. Michael, could you please stand up? All right. All right. Uh, could you move to the side aisle? Well, if, if you think you can project loud enough, go ahead. Uh, okay, sure, why not? All right, I'm asking this because I'm a student and it's sometimes on my mind. It worries me sometimes. I'm sure it worries you too. I mean, just you see in the news that, you know, a, uh, you know, a public shooting is going to break out and it's a c real concern. So my question is, um, how exactly are you going to affect the gun control, gun control situation in America? What regulations are you thinking about putting into place? And, how exactly would you plan on doing, uh, like implementing those regulations? Great question. Um, so first thing, we need common sense gun control that actually the American people overwhelmingly support and gun owners actually support as well. And that includes both background checks and uh, getting assault rifles uh, off the street. So that's where we begin. I would also take away this immunity that gun manufacturers and distributors have right now. So they're not accountable for irresponsible distribution or, irres or creating really dangerous weapons. So every other sector, every other manufacturer uh, has uh, liability laws that apply to them. So we should not carve out this special exemption for the gun industry. So that's where we start. But let me say, Beyond that, we have a real problem of fear in this country. We are an armed garrison state where so many of the shootings take place because people are afraid of each other. You know, that's a lot of what's going on in the, um, you know, in the, in the uh, police shootings, that police are often afraid for their lives. They learn that, or they think that a suspect is armed and they will shoot out of self-defense in their minds. Um, we are all, you know, imagining each other to be our enemies. We are in a garrison state right now, and this is a very dangerous place for all of us. So the other thing we're calling for is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
so we can get down to the bottom of this climate of fear and racism and Islamophobia and uh, Latinophobia and transphobia so that we can actually have a, a facilitated kind of community discussion where we are actually sharing our human stories, our art and our music and trying to bring us onto the same page so we can overcome the historic legacy of racism, the historic legacy of anti-Latino and Islamophobic sentiment and so on, so that we can actually get on the same page, uh, that we are part of the same human family with the same human values. We need to begin to discuss these issues openly and honestly in a facilitated way so that we can move forward. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. Our next question comes from Tom Viley from Howell, New Jersey, and his question is on foreign policy. Tom, could you please stand up? Please stand up. Please stand up. What a great answer, by the way. I never thought about gun control that way. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read this. What is your plan to change the U.S. from being the world's police, and what would that change look like? Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, yeah, so how to change our foreign policy from being the police of the world. You know, we're not only the police of the world, but we are, um, you know, we're sort of armed. We have, we have um, bases all around the world, but this didn't happen by accident, you know. These were put there so that we could continue to have sort of control over the energy supply and the routes of transportation. So backing off of this role as policing the world really depends on our changing our energy. Um, I mean, it's the wrong thing to do. It's, you know, it's immoral for us to be imposing our will on other countries, in my view. If you look at all the other countries around the world and you ask how many foreign bases do they have, it adds up. If you take all the other countries, all put together, they have about 30 foreign bases. And we have somewhere around 800. So what's wrong with this picture? You know, this is what a dying empire looks like. We cannot be so far flung, and we're not, you know, creating friends. You develop a trigger finger when you've got weapons uh, ready to be used all around the world. We start trying to solve problems in all the wrong ways that doesn't solve those problems. So we need to put our dollars into true security. We need to be clear about what the consequences of this far-flung military is that it is bankrupting us, that it is making us less secure, that it is creating failed states. We need to be honest, and we need to work with our, uh, you know, the other world powers, for example, Russia and China, um, because they also cannot afford the military that they have. They also are facing the world's greatest problem, which is climate change. They also need to be putting their money into transforming their energy system and greening their energy. So we need constructive engagement with the other countries around the world so that we're all moving to demilitarize our foreign policy and put our dollars into true security with green energy and energy independence and a collaborative uh, international community based on human rights and international law. That's the direction we need to go. Thank you. All right, thank you, Tom. Our next question comes from Whitney Derman of Robbinsville Township, New Jersey, and she has a question on capitalism. Whitney, could you please stand up? Okay, hi. You just have to move to the side. Um, first, I want to say it's an absolute honor having, he having you here to speak. Thank you so much for coming to Rutgers today. Okay, so my question is, um, recently the Green Party has switched to, has declared itself to be anti-capitalism. What made you decide on this switch? And do you think it will put the party at a disadvantage because of lingering anti-communism views from the um, Cold War era? And how do, you, you, how do you plan to get around this to win over more supporters? Great, okay. Um, so. Let me use some language that is part of that um, new platform position. 
And it said that, um, you know, it, it is that the Green Party's view of the economy is to promote economic democracy. That the people who are actually a part of the economy need to have the say about what kind of economy we have, whether it's in our workplaces or how we do our banking. Uh, just the rules of the game need to be set by the people who are impacted by the economy, not by those who happen to have greatest wealth and uh, greatest resources. So one of the words that we use is to say this is what democracy looks like when applied to an economy. And it's kind of common sense that an economy should be based on what people want and what people need, sort of basic principles of economic justice. Um, now, there are some isms that can be used here as well. So some people will say, you know, this is anti-capitalism. Others say this is also not state socialism, that this is another way forward based on economic democracy. In my own experience, you know, I don't really come out of the political world or the, um, you know, the world of economics. I'm a healthcare provider by training and profession. So I'm used to just talking to everyday people in an everyday kind of way. So I generally don't use that language that special uh, education, you know, and special knowledge allows you to use. So I tend not to use it because I'm not maybe smart enough or maybe not uh, educated enough to talk in those terms and be really confident about what we mean. And I find many people out there are also not confident about, about what these terms mean. So I like to break it down to basically an economy that's fair and an economy that works for all of us and an economy where the golden rule applies the golden rule that most of us subscribe to, basic community values of doing unto others, of creating an economy that's going to work for all of us and provides basic fairness for everyone. So that's the kind of language that I would use in explaining the, um, this new policy platform of the Green Party that tries to really put some distance, I think, between the Green Party and this kind of uh, financialized, top-down, uh, crony capitalist economy that we have right now that's really driving us over the cliff. So we call for a different way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Isaac Margolis of Piscataway Township, New Jersey. And Isaac has a question about vaccines. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, hi, Dr. Stein. So back in late July, you said during an interview with the Washington Post that a lot of the regu regulatory boards that test and evaluate vaccines are actually rich in corporate and uh, pharmaceutical influence, which is uh, strangely actually a common argument used by the so-called anti-vaxxers. Uh, how is that argument cogent or even relevant given that most of the people on the vaccine and related biological products committee are actually accredited doctors and workers for major academic and medical institutions? Great. So let me just explain. I go way back with the FDA, before vaccinations were ever an issue. I was fighting uh, to recognize mercury in fish, and the FDA actually regulates fish, and public health advocates had to fight long and hard to get the FDA to pay attention to a big health issue, uh, to warn and educate the public that there were certain kinds of fish out there. I mean, this is all common knowledge now, but it's common knowledge because we had to fight tooth and nail with the FDA who was working to protect the fishing industry and didn't want word getting out that certain kinds of fish uh, put people at risk. And uh, it wasn't only the FDA, it was also with state regulatory boards and so on. So I have learned as a public health advocate that we have to work very hard so that the power of money is not controlling our regulatory agencies. They need to be standing up for us, not for the big money interests, whether it was the fishing industry or the pharmaceutical industry. And there another example is what happened with Vioxx, a, um, a pharmaceutical that was causing heart disease, had caused 140,000 serious cases of heart disease before the FDA allowed 
word out about that and allowed physicians to be warned and allowed patients to be warned. And this was, it took years to actually get the FDA to allow this information to come out. And it wasn't the people on the regulatory board. Those who were actually looking at Vioxx were screaming to get this out. It was the people higher up who were suppressing the information. So that's, you know, that's where I'm coming from on these issues of fighting to be sure that our regulatory agencies are fighting for us, that they are putting people over profit, that we end the revolving door, because why should the Monsanto lobbyists be deciding whether or not GMOs are good for the environment and for our health? This should not be decided by the industries who are being regulated. We need to shut down the revolving door and we need to get the money out of politics and get our agencies back working for us. All right, thank you, Isaac, for the excellent question. Our next uh, questioner is Charles Franchino from Andover, New Jersey. Charles, could you raise, stand up? Charles has a question about homelessness. <clears throat> Please move to the aisle. Hello. Hi, Charles. This is an honor. Likewise. Okay. Homelessness is an issue hardly ever addressed in political campaigns, and this year has been no different. Uh, what are your ideas towards ending or addressing homelessness as an epidemic? Great, thank you very much for bringing that up. So homelessness is really a national scandal. We have more empty and abandoned homes than we have homeless people. What's wrong with this picture? We should be rehabbing or otherwise utilizing those empty homes and making sure that everyone is housed in this country. Uh, we can do that uh, in many ways, but you know, as I mentioned, we have lots of resources here that are available, we just need to be using them for the things that help people, not things that are helping the weapons industry and so on. We have the resources to do this, but we also need to make sure that our communities and our housing programs are not being designed for maximum profit because that's how it works right now. We have developers that come in, we gentrify, uh, we allow homes to be gentrified and neighborhoods to be gentrified and then families wind up becoming homeless and people wind up becoming homeless because the, uh, the property becomes too expensive. I mean, we see this over and over again in community after community where developers are basically, uh, you know, they're, they're running the show. We need to put communities back in charge of deciding what kind of housing we need and what kind of housing we deserve. So that includes allowing communities to establish rent control where they need to do that. And it means building affordable housing, bringing back public housing. We've been shrinking our supply of truly affordable public housing that people need. We need a diversity of housing and that needs to be created on behalf of people, not on behalf of greatest profit. Thank you. Thank you. Our last question for tonight is by Adam Iachio from Pequenock Township, uh, New Jersey. Hey, could you, all right, move over to the uh, side, please. And Adam has a question about elections. Great. Or the election, really. Um, you actually pretty much answered it in your main speech, but um, okay. so I changed my question to, would you grant Edward Snowden clemency, and what would you do about the problems facing cyber security and privacy? I would not only grant Edward Snowden clemency, I would ask him to be part of my cabinet so that we could solve this question. Edward Snowden, he is a true patriot for standing up for our constitutional rights when they were being massively violated by a government which was incredibly overreaching, still is incredibly overreaching by basically spying on all of us. You know, it's fine to, um, to violate the privacy where there is due cause and where there is due process. 
But right now we have this FISA court that basically gives a rubber stamp to essentially all requests on all spying, including blanket, um, you know, mass spying on everyone. So this is wrong. Edward Snowden put himself at great risk to tell the American public the real truth about what was going on. And we need real patriots like him to be actually serving our country so that we can be uh, properly protecting our security at the same time we protect our privacy. We should not have to sacrifice privacy in the name of security. According to Benjamin Franklin, because this issue has been an issue going way back to the very founding of our country, when Benjamin Franklin said that those who would sacrifice privacy in the name of security will wind up losing them both. We need to stand up for our civil liberties, for our privacy, for our freedom of the press, and for an accountable and transparent government. We need personal privacy, but government transparency because an all-knowing government is an all-powerful government, and all power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So we need a government where we, the people, are in charge. We need our privacy rights protected, and together we can go forward into that future that protects both our democracy as well as our liberties and our securities. We can do that together. It's really been an honor to be here with you tonight. And I look forward to working together to keep building this revolution for people, planet, and peace over profit. Together we are unstoppable. I hope to see you at Hofstra University. Let's take our democracy back. Thank you so much.